It's one of those things where time gets away from us. It's like, wow, how does this happen? Uh, but one of the things that can happen is that we overlook, overlook the uh, preparation, the preparation time uh, for Christmas. Now, if you were raised in a tradition, I mentioned this in the study time uh, during our Sunday school time, if you were raised in a tradition where you never, ever, ever talked about Advent, there seemed to be all this conversation that jumped you right into Christmas, but then there was times that you just didn't seem like you were prepared for it. And so I was raised in that early on, and some of you may be the same way. But there's something very, very important about Advent to help us be prepared for the coming of Jesus. Because the word Advent does mean coming. It does mean anticipation. You remember the, the Carly Simon song, you know, in the ketchup bottle, and you're waiting for the ketchup to come out. Anticipation, and, and then that of preparation. And then spe- specifically today, I'm going to talk about uh, expectation. But if we're going to talk about expectation uh, of what or, or for what, and so maybe some of you relate to this first picture, everything is just ducky for you, everything's just perfect for you and your family, you gather around the Christmas tree and you're looking really nice and you're all dressed up and, and everybody's smiling and it's kind of the old duck dynasty thing of happy, 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 all right? When in reality for many it's more like this other picture where it's pretty chaotic, Right? And many of you probably can relate to this. Now, they're still smiling, which is a good sign. Uh, Many of you maybe have been a part of family Christmases where the smiles went away quickly. And uh, then you know what I'm talking about as far as the, uh, the chaos that can ensue. Now, for many of us, we've probably experienced both. Both the smiles and, and the, the, the warmth of Christmas as we gather around with family and friends and so forth. But then also the chaos that can come. And as one person mentioned in the Sunday school hour, the stress that can come at the time of Christmas. Well, if we're going to talk about expectations, and that's what we are going to talk about, uh, what expectations do you have? What expectations do you bring uh, to the table, if you will, as we come Uh, together on this first Sunday of Advent. And so that's the reason we're going to do this Advent series, the reason we're doing the study together called Under Wraps, the gift we never uh, expected. The intent is that as we do so, we might be more focused, that we might be more expectant in meeting God, that we might be more expectant in the experience of who God is, and that we might even be changed by God through Jesus Christ the ultimate Christmas gift. So we're we're beginning this time. It's four weeks, all right, of Advent. This Sunday, we're going to talk about a God who is expectant. Next Sunday, we're going to talk about a dangerous God. Next, the following Sunday, a jealous God. And then the last Sunday, a faithful God, which then leads us to Christmas Eve and a couple of the services that we'll have that night. I'm going to talk about the continuation of the proclamation and that being that of the good news. So uh, that's, some of the, that's kind of a, a road map of where we're going this next few weeks. Now, today we're talking about God being expectant, so I, I entitled this message Christmas Expectations, okay? And you're going to find out if you're in the Sunday school class, that, and if you have the book, that yes, I will reference a few things here and there out of this, but I also want to be sharing some of the things that I'm bringing to the table from Scripture and so forth, so that we're not, we're not just on top of each other and you're going, well, I don't have to bother because he's just reading the book to me. I don't want to do that to you at all. And so uh, it'll, it'll be a more holistic approach as we do all of those things together. <clears throat> but I want to read from Isaiah, a, a familiar passage, Isaiah 9, 6, uh, and 7, okay? Now, even if you weren't raised in the church, you've probably heard this somewhere, all right? From Isaiah chapter 9. And we find uh, the context being this, that uh, the people of Israel had been a disobedient people. God had told them, look, there are consequences for your disobedience. And in in fact, exile, ultimately exile. And so those things that were to come as far as exile uh, wasn't a very pretty picture for Israel. However, at the beginning of chapter 9, it says yet, or it says nevertheless, know this about the God of whom you serve, and we pick up in the middle of that at verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, 
establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. It does not say it might accomplish. He may accomplish. We hope he accomplishes. No, he will accomplish this, a promise, as God spoke through Isaiah. So I want to begin with this point today of the expected, okay? The expected. Now, those of you who know me, been around me a little while now, so several, you know, we've, we've been here, what, we're in our fourth year, <clears throat> you know this about me, that waiting or patience is not necessarily my strong suit, nor is it necessarily my spiritual gift, all right? That's your opportunity to say amen, you know. My wife was the loudest. Did you catch that? <clears throat> and so, you know, just, uh, you know, it's one of those things. Who, who wants to wait around anyways, really for anything? Now, I use a lot of illustrations with hunting, right? And so, you know, I just went hunting again with my kids. We do this yearly thing these last few days and had a great time. But when I go with, with my bow and arrow, it, it really is a waiting game. You have to spend time in that tree stand or wherever. And I mean, you know, we're not talking just five or ten minutes. And I don't, you know, five or ten minutes is about enough for me, to be honest with you. But we're talking usually two to three hours. And man, oh man, oh man. Even, even when I try to pray, I have trouble trying to make it. You know, it just, it's just a struggle, that whole waiting thing. And, and you know, I thought about it in light of other things in the life of the church. For example, some of you who I've had the privilege of officiating your wedding. Like you, Victoria. Hannah, Kyle, others, Gina, all right, all right, uh, so the whole waiting thing, you know, it's like, what are we waiting till four o'clock, let's just do this thing, ten o'clock, everybody's here anyways, let's just do it, you know, we're waiting around, and everybody's kind of fumbling around, and you know, the, 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 the groom is twiddling his thumbs, and, and the, of course the bride's getting all prettied up, and we want to allow time for that, we know that, but it's like, man, Let's do this thing. But we wait. We wait. And then you, then you begin to think there's something even theological about this because at some point the bride is going to arrive. Think about that in an eschatological sense, meaning when Jesus will return as far as the church and the groom and the bride and so forth. So, yeah, you know, the waiting thing. And, and you know, a few weeks ago we had the one worship service. And I like when we do that all together. I really like that one worship service. But I am thinking, how in the world, what are we waiting till 10 o'clock for? The day's half over. You know, I'm sitting here waiting around, and some of you going, well, I haven't even hardly got up yet. But man, let's get on it, you know? It's just one of those things. And it's just me. I'm just confessing. I'm becoming vulnerable before you all. All right? I'm sharing with you so that you can better pray for your pastor. You know, good things come to those who wait, but do I have to? You know, do I have to? And, and so many times it's like, well, we've wasted so much time already. Let's get on it. But we learn some things in the waiting. And thus is the case for the people of Israel as they were waiting and waiting and waiting, longing, yearning for the one who was to come, the Messiah, okay? And there were what were called messianic expectations, the expectations of the Messiah who was to come. They were expecting a Savior, someone to rescue them. When you're in trouble, you're looking for someone to rescue you. Israel was in trouble. They'd been under Roman rule for years. They'd been under Greek rule before that, on and on. So, so they were looking for someone to come and to save them. They were under Roman, the Roman regime. They're looking for the superhero, if you will. You know, because we're, we're dealing with all these superheroes nowadays, they were looking for the superhero to show up and to save them. They had high expectations of this one to come and to overthrow the evil Roman Empire, to defeat the enemy, to establish the new rule, the new kingdom where peace would prevail. All right, And so this hero that they were looking for, this Savior, this Messiah, was coming at least in their minds as someone who was strong and, and powerful and mighty, and as we talked in our Sunday school time, who would ride in on the big white horse victorious 
to defeat the enemy and lead the people into this glorious, peaceful, peaceful kingdom. I mean, really, I just read about it. They, they knew these words. They knew about Isaiah. They knew about the other prophets. They knew about the foretelling of this one who was to come. They'd been waiting a long time. There were what they called the silent years. They really weren't so silent, but there was those years where they were not really hearing from a prophet. And, and where's this Messiah everybody's been talking about? Especially you, Isaiah, because you just told us several hundred years back, and we've been waiting and waiting and waiting. And they thought of these words. The government will be on his shoulders. The Messiah's shoulders, okay? The hero. He would be a wonderful counselor. Mighty God. Everlasting Father. Prince of Peace. This is one who would rule with, with a power and an authority. An everlasting rule, okay? Wisdom. Peace. Royalty. All of this. Authority. So there was a greatness, and there was this reigning of this one to come who would reign on David's throne. It was promised that through the line of David, you remember the great King David, would come the Messiah. And so they were waiting. Justice would come, and righteousness would come. And besides, there was the promise, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And yet they're waiting. And we sing the song, and we've sung it for years, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. They had hopes and they had fears all those years are met in thee. Well, the thee they're waiting on is this Messiah, and they had an expectation of this Messiah, but they found some things out. And there was a question then, why was the expected unexpected? Or at least it's a question I have. Why was the expected unexpected? They expected this Messiah, but sure didn't come the way they expected. So that leads to the second point of the unexpected, all right? The unexpected. Now, I mentioned this in the first service, and uh, I said, you know, I'm still, I'm still recovering from the surprise birthday bash that Mary Lou busted on me. All right? Many of you were here for that. We had that one service, you know, and, and you know, it's kind of like, it's, we got to wait till 10 o'clock, you know, but we, and, and all of a sudden, all these people showed up, and some of you from far away showed up, and, 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 you know, it's like, oh, man, she got me good. I'm still trying to recover and think of ways to get back, <laughs> because last week, I confessed Clint Eastwood still plays a role in my life, <laughs> but I won't because I want to remain married. All right, But there was this the absolutely unexpected happened. I, I had no idea. It was not on my radar at all anywhere with regards to this kind of party and people coming from all over previous churches and all these kind of things. And, you know, I, I knew that I might eat a piece of cake for my birthday, but had no idea we were going to get together and have a big to-do. All right? So it was wonderful. Now, it was a great celebration. You know, there are, there are some other birthdays or some other celebrations that were not on the radar either as we go back and see about this one who came as Messiah. Because he came in a totally unexpected way. Now let's think about it. If you're going to have a birthday, you must first have a birth. <laughs> you can't celebrate a birthday without a birth, right? Does that make sense? Three of you? Yes? Just making sure. I mean, do we have to go through the biological thing? I don't, thank you. Thank you, Stan. Now think about this. For there to be a birth, there must be a pregnancy. Now I am not going much farther than this. All right? So we can understand this. All right? There must be a pregnancy. And as we look back to the story or stories, we see that there are two pregnancies occurring simultaneously, taking place, and they are occurring, of course, prior to the birthdays, so there were unexpected birth announcements of these who were to be born. There was this one woman, elderly woman, past her prime. One hand. Other hand. A young girl. Very young girl. Not yet in her prime. Back to the other hand. How many hands do we have? Back to the other hand. We have the elderly woman. Elizabeth. Okay? 
She's the wife of Zechariah. Zechariah was a priest serving in the temple. And if you recall, the angel comes, has this announcement for Zechariah the priest. They have this conversation. And within the conversation in verse 13, because there had been questions asked by Zechariah, but the angel said to him, notice what? Do not be afraid. Every time it's do not be afraid. Why? Because we're afraid. Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to call him Ze- John. <laughs> right? I mean, they're all ready for Zach too, or Zach too, but it's, it's John. Now, jo- Zechariah didn't quite know what to make of it, and in the conversation, the angel says, you know, you should really listen to me and, and believe me, and just because you really didn't, I'm going to shut your mouth for a little while till the baby's born, all right? Now, this is my uh, spiritual gymnastic exegetical extension um, strange hermeneutic. How do you like that? that I want to share with you. You see, Zechariah's mouth was shut for these nine months or so. Now here's the stretch. His wife had been wanting to become pregnant for years, years. She now becomes pregnant. Do you think he's going to get a word in anyways? (laughs) No. Makes sense, right? Don't quote me. (laughs) All right? I'm just saying. So we have that going on. Elizabeth is so excited. It'd been, she'd been, she, you know, uh, God had opened her womb. She was to bear a son. Now we have in contrast this young virgin, this young woman, the parthenos is the Greek word, this young virgin, young teenager, not even married, and getting this announcement, the annunciation, this announcement uh, that comes to her from an angel about this one, uh, and, and she's finding out, what are you talking about, pregnant thing? I haven't even been with anybody. And he says, oh, by the way, don't be afraid, right? Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth, birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. So we have these two uh, birth announcements, strangely different and yet strangely the same. Both of these find themselves pregnant. One is older been waiting for a baby for a long, long time, longing for a child, barren, now finding herself with child. And then this one other, Mary, no idea. Baby was nowhere on the radar, finding herself to be with child, not only with child, but one to uh, save the world. We find herself unexpectedly expecting. And as Jessica Legrone said in the video, uh, we have the young girl and the older woman, anti-acne cream meets anti-wrinkle serum. <laughs> and how they have the conversation. And, and, and notice the, the, the one who recognizes that she's pregnant first is the baby in the womb, John, flipping and flopping, all right? But somehow, both of these women find themselves right smack dab in the middle of God's plan to save the world. One child will prepare the way. One child is the way. There's a difference. John prepares. Jesus is the way. All right? But it's not the way anyone expected, especially by those who are looking for some powerful military leader uh, who should be the Messiah. No, this Messiah is coming as the Savior of the world, the rescuer, the hero, coming as a baby. A baby. And it's kind of like, well, what were you expecting? Well, I wasn't expecting a baby to save us. But the scripture reminds us over and over <clears throat> that God works in mysterious ways, right? I mean, half of you, anyways, are saved because of God working in mysterious ways. Think about it. And the other half are, sa- are saved by the same way. <laughs> So, I mean, just God works in mysterious ways to bring us to salvation, salvation to, to throw us the rope of rescue because we find ourselves in a pit, we find ourselves in a hole, we're looking for somebody to rescue us, and God says, I got you, I got you covered. And he throws a rope, and at the end of it, there's this like little manger thing with a baby on it. He's like, what am I going to do with this? We find out that the Savior of the world comes as a, a little baby. 
we see that God came um, under wraps in a package wrapped in swaddling clothes. And as the package was unwrapped, we realized that this gift is God in the flesh. We talked about the incarnation earlier in the Sunday school class. The Word became flesh, it says in John 1. And He made His dwelling among us. Now, that's, that's a strange way to save the world, seems like, like the song. How God became a baby. He tabernacled, you know the word. He set up his tent. He came to dwell within us. He came to be with us as Emmanuel, as it says in Matthew. He became like us. He became just like this farmer was wishing, man, I wish I could be a goose so I could be like them so I could lead them into safety. Well, guess what? God says, I became your goose so I could lead you into safety. I became one of you to lead you into safety, to bring you out of the storm that we might know and experience God and His unexpected love for us. You know, that farmer's life was changed forever as all of a sudden he had that serendipitous, aha, smack you in the face kind of moment. Jesus became like us to give us hope, both expected and unexpected. And as we know in Isaiah and as we read in the Psalms, His ways are not our ways. His ways are higher than our ways. He knows more than we. And that leads to the renewed expectations. Renewed. Now here's the deal. You want to surprise someone this week? Especially those of you who might have a few miles under your belt. Here's the deal. You want to surprise somebody? You tell them you're expecting. <laughs> All right? Now guys, if you tell them that, we got a big story going on. So then you get really, eyebrows are up, everybody's really paying attention, you know, you make the front of the cover of time and all this kind of stuff, you know. So, you want to surprise somebody? But it's true, isn't it? As Christians, are we not to be expecting? Are we not to be a people who are expecting that God would actually do something, the very things He tells us He will do? We are an expectant people because God is an expectant God. We are responding to the God who expects something, and therefore we are to be expectant. What are you expecting this Christmas, this season? Anything? Presents under a tree? A little eggnog? A fight <laughs> over the table? I mean, you know, those are things that happen. Or the same old, same old. Sometimes, you know what, I, I've told the staff before, you know, when we were meeting about kind of putting some things together, thinking about Christmas and, and the worship team and all this kind of stuff, I said, you know, didn't we do that last year? Didn't we have this Christmas thing a year ago? Because sometimes it feels like we just kind of go through the motions. We get ourselves in a rut. And a rut is nothing more than a grave with both ends kicked out, if you think about it. I mean, who, who wants to be in a rut all the time? And, and there, there's some things that after a while, all this other stuff, all, all, the, all the advertising on TV and, and all, all the yik-yak paddywhack and all the singing about jingle bells and all that kind of stuff, it just, it, it's just empty. There's just nothing there, you know? Yeah, I mean... Think surely there's something that we can expect God to do in our lives this year. Something different. That we might experience Him in a different way. I believe God's expecting some things of us. God is an expectant God. You know, He expected to change the world through the birth of Jesus. That was His plan. That was an expectation. He expected to break through the darkness, the despair, the fear, the chaos to bring about hope. And joy and peace and light, that's an expectation of God. It's not just wishful thinking. It's not just, well, I hope this thing works. God expected to see hardened hearts soften and turn towards Him. Like the farmer who didn't want to go be with his wife and kids, you know. And ended up all of a sudden having a softened heart. Kind of a Wesley moment, a heart strangely warmed, if you will. You see, God, through the gift of Jesus, expected to change the world. That's his plan. That, that is his plan through Jesus. There's not another plan. It's through Jesus. And so we have to ask ourselves, I, I ask you, I ask myself, but are you longing for God to change something in the world? And I think most of us would say, yeah, you bet. I mean, and in a way, that's an easier question to deal with because all we're saying is we long for God to do something out there in somebody else's life, right? To change something in the world. 
You know, one time uh, we were being served a meal somewhere, and I, I like to ask from time to time the servers, I said, you know, we're going to pray for a meal. Is there anything you'd like us to pray for you for? And some of them are good about it, and some of them don't know what to say, and one person just said, world peace. Well, that was kind of a generality, but, you know, that's not a bad prayer. World peace, especially since the Prince of Peace is the one who has come. So, are you longing for God to change someone you love? How about those who are closer to you? And maybe in your own family. Or how about this? That God will change you. That's where the rubber meets the road, right? That God will change you. Well, Advent focuses on this word coming, preparation, expectation, etc. But God loves it when we come before Him with expectant hearts. O come, O come. Emmanuel, O come all ye faithful, as we respond to his coming to us. There's a wonderful reality of expectation here, and that's new birth, new birth. And so my prayer for you, for me, for us at Asbury, for you who might be visiting wherever it is that you come from, that, that God might do a work in and through, of us, through us and even in spite of us, that we might uh, experience that which he expects, and then we might in turn expect that God would do a work. So let that be the case, and that let us renew, then, our expectations. Let's pray. God, we come before you, and we're grateful for the way that uh, you work. We're grateful the way that uh, you've come to us through your son, Jesus. We, we really have no concept, really uh, no real understanding of what all that means. That's a difficulty for us. And so I pray that we would come to grips with that, in, in a way at least that would help us move forward in our relationship with you. We come with expectations, Lord, and if we don't, then move us to a point to where we would have expectations uh, to, to experience you more fully. So we give you thanks, we give you praise in Jesus' name, and God's people said, Amen.